Well, I think you, you've covered you know the main points pretty, pretty well. Um, I'll just say it's it's, been, it's a pleasure to be to be here uh, with, with Bill and with, and with Dick, um, whom I knew when they were both doctor students um, in the epidemiology department here. Um, I've been a long time admirer of Bill Jenkins. I think he's one of the most courageous people in this field. <coughs> just has made a tremendous uh, contribution uh, to the field, particularly in terms of educating um, young African Americans, uh, starting master's programs in a variety of places, and just being a, a wonderful model and symbol of people who care about you know, the disparities and who dedicate their lives to trying to do something about all you know, the disparities. You talk about how you want to change the world, well, you know, here's a guy who really, really has changed the world. Some very important ways. <coughs> so it's really it's an honor to be sitting next to Bill. Um, and Vic and I have known each other for a very long time, and it's been fun for me to watch um, Vic's evolution, you know, from you know being one of the hotshot methodologists, you know, uh, in epidemiology and teaching, you know, teaching the courses, you know, advanced methods in in this uh, department, in the department of epidemiology, and then. Observing how his commitment to to the education of, um, of minority students from a variety of underrepresented backgrounds, how that has grown uh, over the decades. His commitment, you know, to the Minority Health Conference uh, has just been stunning. He's just been he's just been unwavering in terms of, of his commitment um, to this area. So there are lots of ways, you know, to make to make important contributions in lots of ways to change the world. Um, and whether it's through, you know, working with kids around nutrition issues, um, lifestyle issues, helping them to learn how to eat better, creating a village in which they can grow up to be healthy, uh, or working on some larger kind of platform and its aspirations to on a larger scale in terms of whole physical environment, cities, neighborhoods. Um, and you know, fighting for, you know, fighting for uh, greater justice and recognition of people who are excluded, you know, uh, despite having shared you know, similar history of oppression and exclusion, they not be recognized as, as being deserving of additional resources. So, you know, the good news is, and it's also the bad news, there's a lot of work to be done. The good news is that there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> you, know, you won't be bored. Uh, the, challenges, the challenges persist. Um, so I'm, I'm, really, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, there's nothing that I enjoy doing more at this point in my career. This is my 41st career, 41st year, uh, not my 41st career, my 41st <laughs> year uh, as a professor. In, uh, and so uh, there's nothing more that I, that I enjoy than talking to people who are just beginning their careers, since mine is uh, coming to an end now. Uh, so look forward to having a conversation with you. Um, so why don't we just open it up, uh, rather than my talking about things that you may not want to hear, we'll be, sure I want to, we'll be sure I respond to things that you are interested in. There is one thing I, I wanted to put on the agenda. Um, I've been actually, we've been in correspondence with Jillian Castle, John's, one of John's yeah. daughters. You, did you know her? No. Um, and uh, I'm going to be sharing the video with her. Mm -hmm. And it would be wonderful for all of us if you could talk some more about John Castle than you got a chance to upstairs in the, in the interview. Uh, just so we can have that as part of the class, because it's something that we wanted to include. Yeah. Well, uh, there's not a lot more than I, that I can say. Of course, the students didn't hear what a little bit I said earlier. Uh, but, um, but as Bill indicated in his uh, overview comments, uh, both of us are here. Uh, we came, and we still have this connection with the department uh, because, of, because of John Castle. So I can tell you for sure I would not have come. I would not have come to Chapel Hill. I would not have come to the analogist had it not been for John Castle. He sold me. Uh, on, on the idea. I, I have a PhD in psychology. I didn't even know what epidemiology was. I 
pretty good scholar, so I probably could have you know, spelled it out, but I couldn't have told you much more about it. Um, uh, but rather than going to you know, many, many deep details about it, it was just that he was such an inspirational person, I mean, a real intellectual, a real intellectual. Not, a, not one of these narrow-minded people, you know, who is obsessed with uh, small questions uh, in broad, broad view uh, about, about the field of epidemiology and its importance to public health, the you know, connection between epidemiology and public health was central in terms of how he wanted uh, the epidemiology department to uh, pursue his mission. And so with that in mind, he was committed to having an interdisciplinary faculty, social scientists, biological scientists of various, various stripes, and strong methodologists. David Kleinbach, the study by statistician, and Larry Cooper, uh, to my understanding, is retired, uh, were both you know, very strong contributors. And so it was an amazing place. It was an amazing group of people that we put together. Uh, and um, uh, so, as I did say earlier to Bill and Dick, um, he recruited me, hired me. I was recruited by the search committee. He, you know, signed off on the hire <laughs> uh, in 1973, and then he went on sabbatical, went back to South Africa, and spent six months in South Africa and six months in London. My first year on the faculty. Uh, so you know, it wasn't all that great for me because he was this. You know, great social social epidemiologist who sort of knew what someone like me needed to learn as a psychologist. There were two psychologists here before me, and they left after 12 years or so. I went to Boston, Christian, uh, to do something in behavioral epidemiology at uh, BU. So they thought, well, let's get another psychologist. And this is early 70s now, 1972, 73, and the University of North Carolina was trying to diversify his faculty, right? Uh, and actually, I was the fourth black professor hired at UNC back in 1973. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so actually, I learned a lot about epidemiology from Al Tarola, who was a very close collaborator with John Castle. He was an amazing methodologist. Castle was a, an amazing theorist. So the two of them, and when they worked together, just a really, really powerful work together. But, um, so when Castle uh, returned from sabbatical in 74, and he only lived for, for about a, a year and a half after that. His lymphoma returned, and he basically was out of commission after about eight or nine months following his return. Or maybe a little bit longer than that. And then he died in 1976 at the very young age of 55. But I have very um, vivid memories of him lecturing in the big auditorium in Rosenau Hall. Uh, It'd be 160. And 160, right. So there will be, so all the students, you know, across all departments would go into the auditorium in Rosenau Hall. And Castle would be on the stage, you know, fiddling with his pipe and walking across the stage lecture. Not a single note, nothing written. Just walking across the stage talking, mesmerizing lecture. I mean, people just, they held on to every word. I mean, it's just so stimulating, so much to be stimulating. And we faculty members would, you know, <laughs> sit there, and we'd be running furious <laughs> Because the idea was that, you know, each of us had, um, what do we call it? We had small groups. Labs. Labs, we called them labs, yeah. yeah. Right, so, uh, so I, I had a lab of maybe 20 some students about who were interested in social epidemiology. So students could sort themselves, you know, into labs having to do with environmental epidemiology. Um, I don't know what else. There was a cardiovascular, cardiovascular and right. a cancer and exactly. a psychoso or chronic disease and a, and a psychosocial. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so then you know we would deal with the nuts and bolts. Castle so would sort of paint the picture and illustrate some things, and we would have to hammer out the nuts and bolts. Give exams and so on. But um, I just remember what an impact he had, and and how professors, my you know, my colleagues, all of whom were more senior than I, um, I mean, year after year, I understood uh, before I came, would 
would sit and, in a sense, be students themselves. Uh, because he was just so interesting. There was always something new to, to learn and to think and to think about. I think that's probably my most vivid memory of him as, as an intellectual at work. The fact that he just had such a deep mastery of uh, uh, the concepts and he knew how to communicate these concepts and to make epidemiology come alive for people who weren't planning to specialize in it. They could see the connection between epidemiology and what they wanted to do in their respective fields. So I, I just learned a lot you know, from watching him. And I learned a lot about the importance of connecting the students. And he was very good at that. I cannot tell you how good he was at connecting with the individual student. He connected with me, he connected with Bill. Students loved him. I mean, students, it would not be too much, it would not be an exaggeration to say that, I mean, students, many students really worship that man. And his death had a profound impact on the students, on the faculty, but particularly on the students. He just loved him. Why? Because he loved them. That's why they loved him, because he loved them. And they knew it. And so that's how you have an impact. You want to change the world? That's how you have an impact. If you love what you do, and if you love the people that you serve, that's what transforms the world. And I think I learned that from John Castle. I think that, because uh, I didn't know anything about teaching. I really wasn't necessarily planning to go into academia. But watching this man relate to people and challenge them, or set an example you know, for what it means to be an intellectual in a field that has such potential for changing the world. Thank you. Thank you. You are a master storyteller. Mm -hmm. I just, every time you relate these historical events, your own personal life or others, I, I just, uh, I think one of my greatest intellectual contributions in the last three decades was the interview that we taped up there. I really, well you heard that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a gala thing. <laughs> 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 you tell stories. <laughs> Thing. Just to say, <laughs> you know, I, as you know, I think ethnicity is important, but it's important because it helps you to think about yourself, to think about how to apply what your background is to the problems that you're trying to solve. And so you're not just black or white or African American or European American, but you are Irish. Or well, I have to admit, part Scott, my great great grandfather, my father, so I was Scottish. That's why I'm so cheap, you know. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but you know, these things make a difference, I think, in the in the way in which we think about how to solve the problems, and even about the problems that we might solve. So when I talk about ethnicity, I'm not talking about the usual census categories. I'm talking about, you know, what where in the back of your head that you might not realize that is motivating you to think about the problems that you might solve and how you might solve them. So anyway, I wanted to just say that. Questions? Anybody who have questions? Okay, so <laughs> let me say this. The first black town in North Carolina is Princeville which fascinated me. So I went to Princeville, and I spent an entire day walking around Princeville. And then um, I had a conversation with you some weeks later, and you tell me that that's where you were when you were doing John Henryism. Mm -hmm. So the idea, tell me how you, as a psychologist, um, starting out with a blank slate, on epidemiology, move from that blank slate, but with the psychological background, move to coming to developing this theory of John Henry. So, let me ask the question first of all. So, who here knows anything about my work on John Henry? Okay, so you, 
you've heard about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so so it, it, it really begins with uh, with the story. Who was it was talking about stories before? Someone I was. <laughs> you know, <laughs> stories. You want you're interested in qualitative. You're interested in qualitative work. You're talking about stories and the importance of listening to people. Yeah. Um, and and so that's where I would begin in terms of talking about the origins of, of my journalism. So now this would be 1978. I had been on the faculty here for five years. Um, and the Department of Epidemiology at, at that time uh, was, I think, best known for his work in cardiovascular epidemiology, uh, the Evans County Project, which was a study of blood blood differences in the risk factors for uh, heart disease, with hypertension being a major um, component of that. So by the late 1970s, though, the National uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute became very interested in funding research projects, uh, community intervention projects, designed to control high blood pressure. Right? So well, we know a lot now about who's at risk. Let's begin to concentrate on how we can how we control high blood pressure because if we can figure out how to do that well, we can prevent a lot of heart attacks. And in the mid-70s, the National Lung Blood Institute had funded projects in three or four major urban areas. Detroit was one, Chicago was another, I forget the other two or so. In the late 70s, it wanted to fund some projects on high blood pressure control in rural communities. And so, uh, under the leadership of the then chairman of the department, Michelle, Michelle Ibrahim, uh, you know, I'm dean of the school for many years, uh, we decided that we would organize ourselves to uh, compete for one of these rural high blood pressure control uh, programs. And we chose Edgecombe County, North Carolina, um, which is uh, in the coastal plains area, right in the middle of what is called the Stroke Death Valley, which runs through the coastal plains of the Carolinas and into Georgia. Um, and we decided that we were going to focus on uh, high blood pressure control among blacks, and particularly black men, because that's the group that is at highest risk for developing um, high blood pressure very early in adult life, and also the group that was at highest risk for not um, seeking medical care, oftentimes you're not even aware that you have it, because it's symptomless, and so you have a stroke or maybe a severe headache, and blood pressure is very high. So there were a lot of challenges in terms of awareness issues, health education issues, awareness issues, treatment issues, access to care, uh, adherence to medication, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to focus on improving hypertension control in African Americans in this high-risk geographical area in North Carolina, one of the poorest areas of the state. And we wanted to focus on men, black men. But we had an idea how to do that. Um, so, I said, maybe I should talk to some black men who have high blood pressure and get their stories and kind of, maybe they'll say something that, you know, will give us some ideas about how we're going to go about doing this. So, one of our collaborators, a physician uh, colleague in epidemiology, was uh, also uh, took care of patients in Alamance County at a community health center. So, he said, well, I'll identify some of some my male patients, and maybe you can talk with them. Just have to open the conversation. I said, great. So I got in my little Volkswagen one day, hot August afternoon, 1978, and I tooled on up to uh, Alamance County. It's not too very far from the Creek. Is it Creek Corps? Not Creek Corps. Creek Corps in Missouri. Anyway, something like that. Uh, Cane Creek? Hmm? Cane Creek? No, no, no. It, it, it's not important. I mean, anyway, it's a very rural community. And uh, I had uh, made prearrangements uh, to interview uh, a 70, I guess he was 74, 74, 75 years old. Which at the time sounded ancient to me. But now that I am 70, it's not so old. 
<laughs> so I met him. He was retired. Um, and so he was waiting for me in his um, backyard. It was really one of those hot, one of those sticky hot July days in North Carolina. And um, so I drove up, and it was probably, I don't know, 11 o'clock or so in the morning. And we sat under big trees in his backyard because he would kind of be shaded by the sun. And I told him why, why I came, but I didn't have any specific questions, but would he just sort of tell me about his life? And we talked about that. So we started talking. And uh, to make a long story short, I've written this up in case you, know, in case you haven't read it and you read it, or I'm going to tell you read it and you can get the whole story if, you, if you're so interested. But to make a long story short, he just told me how he, through hard work and determination, his persistence, refusal to give up, overcame uh, peonage, overcame being a sharecropper. He couldn't, wasn't able to go to school because he needed to work on the farm to help his folks out. So he had to drop out of school in the second grade before he could learn to read and write. And he saw what had happened to his father. You know, his father was just constantly in debt. And he said, oh, I don't want that kind of life. I want to make something of myself. So he happened to marry a woman who, who had come from a landowning family in North Carolina, and she said, I don't want to be the wife of a sharecropper, you know, we <laughs> need to do better than this. So they took out a loan, uh, Wachovia Bank, uh, so that they could purchase uh, almost 100 acres. Because they'd been sharecroppers for a few years now, so this was not the money for us. So with a good deal of trepidation, he went to the bank, took out this loan, and they gave him um, 30 years to pay for it. Yeah, typical kind of mortgage. And as he walked out of the bank, he said, 30 years? Mm -hmm. I'm going to pay for this in one year. <laughs> so, uh, because he didn't want to be so vulnerable to, to the system. Because he, 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 you know, he didn't want to be, he remembered how his parents were always in debt, could never come out of debt. So being in debt was not something he wanted uh, to be. Anyway, so he and his wife, worked night and day, literally night and day sometimes, seven days a week to pay off that mortgage. They paid it off in five years, which is an amazing thing. So in five years, they, had, they owned 100 acres of pretty fertile North Carolina land, free and clear. And he said to me, and I think that that's probably why my knees are out of way now, because I just pushed myself so hard in the now, up to that point, all I knew was that his name was Mr. John Martin. But in, as he was concluding, you know, his uh, story, his wife came to the door. She said, John Henry, it's time for lunch. And bring your guests with you. So I looked at him and I said, your name is John Henry? He said, yeah, my name is John Henry Martin. My thoughts were John Henry Martin. John Henry the Steve Jobs man. And then it, it, I realized that this man's life was really an echo of that legend. Now, he didn't drop dead as did the legend, legendary John Henry, but he paid a price for going up against the machine, just like the legendary John Henry did. The price that he paid for going up against the machine, the machine here being the sharecropper system, being this system of exploitation of, of blacks in the South, that was the machine. And he went up against it. And he beat it, but he paid a price. So then I started thinking about all the other people that I knew. My dad, my mom, my uncles, my aunts. We had high blood pressure. And I began to think, well, gee, maybe this, maybe this is a big part of the problem here. People going up against the machine, people working themselves so hard, you know, to be free and to and to put in place a a foundation so that their children would not have to experience what they themselves had to experience. And that, that's why they were scrubbing the floors, you know, and holding their tongue and, and working in the hot sun, you know, because they had a dream. Yes, for themselves, but more importantly for their kids. <coughs> and, and it's not that and today, I mean, I certainly think that nutrition is really very important, I think exercise is very important. 
But if you want to understand what stress is and where it comes from, particularly for African Americans and working class African Americans, if you understand what it looks like, um, where it comes from and how endemic it is, you have to understand something about the context of their lives and how they are engaging it. Right? And, and the folks that I know, and I would I just say 90%, equivalent of the estimate, but I would say that 90% of African Americans all over the country, urban areas, rural areas, doesn't matter where they live, 90% of African Americans work hard. You know, they they are Americans. They believe in they believe in pursuing the American dream. They believe in hard work. They believe in being responsible. Um, they believe in taking care of their own. But you know, the system is structured in such a way that it's very hard for them to be able to realize that truth. Really. And yet they persist. Yet they keep going. And in the process of that, what happens is that over the years there's all this wear and tear of their cardiovascular system. I'm sure if you're familiar now with the concept of allostatic load. Well, that's what it is. It's the build of an allostatic load, which then manifests itself in an ex a biological, an accelerated biological aging of the cardiovascular system. That's the way that I've come to understand the epidemic of hypertension in African Americans. Um, and so I, I'm going to pause in just a moment. So then, okay, so I had this idea about how do I, okay, how do I measure it? I mean, after all, I'm an epidemiologist, I figured out how to measure this thing, right? Well, that was where the psychology background comes in. So we're talking about stress, we're talking about coping. So I just had to figure out a way to put some numbers on this concept. So I read everything I could find about the legend of John Henry. And then I started writing questions based on the legend and based on the work songs. So I listened to a lot of music, you know, work songs. And I just wrote from this cultural text. And then when I went to Princeville, um, which is one of the oldest black towns in the country, probably competes with Mount Bayou, Mississippi. So yeah. Competes with Mount Bayou, Mississippi, which John Hatch has such a strong association with. Yeah. As the two oldest black towns in the country. So I went there to, Princeville is located in Edgecombe County, so my first sabbatical I went there to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to go there and kind of do some participant observation work, some qualitative work, and then I'm going to design an epidemiological study to test my John Henderson hypothesis. And then I want to feed my, these insights you know, into the larger project that we want to do in Edgecombe County, John Hyde Control, because we got the money, <laughs> she said. Uh, and so that's what I did with my very first sabbatical from the UNC. I went to live in Princeville for like four months. And um, integrated myself into the community. I lived live with a 65 year old uh, widow. I think this is, the town was like 98% black, very poor. And she opened doors for me. You know, she introduced, see, you can't just go into a community and say, I'm from UNC Chapel Hill. Oh, okay, you know, okay. Tell me, uh -uh, it doesn't work that way. You got you to be introduced to people. Somebody has to verify that you're legit. You know, and so she she gave me legitimacy. I went to church with her, and she would introduce me to people. She had to go to Sam, so, Sam, 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 so. And she had a lot of you know credibility in the community. You know, she was not well educated or anything. And uh, so then I was able to just get to know guys. I hung out with guys. My parties went to nightclubs. You know, uh, hung out with the unemployed guys. The the alcoholics who didn't have jobs. You know. I just hung out with them. Mm -hmm. And that was how I really just sort of learned about the culture. And, uh, and uh, then when I came back, it's interesting. I could go on with this for days, so you have to really tell me to stop. Uh, but this process of, now I grew up in a, not in a, an all black town, but in a town where there was, the black population was pretty much working class. But now, you know, after going to college and going to graduate school and all that, you kind of lose some of those street smarts, mm -hmm. you know, you kind, of, you kind of lose it. And so if you then go into a community like Princeton, you're a UNC professor, 
you got to change the way you present yourself. You got to change the way you dress. And in a sense, if you're going to become truly integrated and accepted in, you know, in a community of, of you know, uh, guys, black men who are not particularly educated but who are smart in their own way, you got to change the way you talk. Uh, and so I, I had to I had to relearn a lot of stuff just to integrate myself into this community and to learn the things that I wanted to learn. <laughs> And so then when I would come back to Chapel Hill, my wife would say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, what, what happened to you? you know? Because I still had that sort of you know, way of being. And it took me a couple of days to change again into sort of the, the UNC professor. And then when I went back in the community, I had to change again. It was really very interesting. Um, but it was the, you know, it was one of the most, uh, it was, it made my career, to put it simply. I mean, that, that experience made my career. It made me an epidemiologist. I wasn't an epidemiologist before that. I was a psychologist. Bill still was referring to me as a psychologist. Yeah, so in terms of my academic training, yes. But after that experience, I became a social epidemiologist. And then, you know, the, the work on John and Kinders and just grew. People began to, you know, try to replicate it in various other parts of really the world. Translated this instrument that I scaled that I've always been translated in like ten languages. Uh, sometimes you know we got good results that look like what we found in Eastern North Carolina. Sometimes we don't. Uh, but you know you don't really expect it to always work out. That's just not really, life is too complex. But I'm still working. I'm still trying to still have an article I'm writing right now. You know, and that's this I just started in 1978. Here it is, what 20, 2014, and I'm as ex you can tell I'm as excited about it in February of 2014 as I was for the first, the first moment that the idea popped into my head. You know, and, and, that's, and, that's what, and that's what you want. You, know, you want something that you can grow with and that will continue to excite you, you know, throughout your life. I'll probably go to my grave and still not have figured it all out, but that's okay. okay. <coughs> I didn't mean for that to be so long, but actually that's a short version. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask, what is the scale? Your scale is called? The John Henry is an active coping scale. Active. Yeah, the Jack, J-H-A-C, or well, sometimes the Jack 12. Uh, but if you Google John Henry, you, you, the scale will actually come up. Yeah, there have been something like 30, probably 30 or 35 doctoral dissertations. Not my students, I don't let my students work on John Henry's. This is just too close. Mm -hmm. We're going to do their own thing, but in various other fields. Yes, please. Do you think um, in, the, in your paper you mentioned that there wasn't a difference at the time between um, men and women, so you just had it black and white. Do you feel that um, John Henryism John Henry's, Henry's will be more apparent in maybe black women today as they are outnumbering men in the um, workforce and academic field? That is a great question. So, okay, so you have read the paper. I know you've read the paper. I don't know too much excruciating detail. I'm sure it's open that. Um, and then we could have begun with your question, you see. Um, I used to think that there weren't important gender differences. I, I don't believe that anymore. I mean, I think that the scores might be the same, but, but I think that, the, that what makes up those scores, what makes up those high scores for white women and white men, it's very different, and we don't really understand. We don't really understand, you know, so it goes into that. Um, we don't understand as much about social class uh, uh, contribution. Now that we have a larger, you know. So unlike in Edgecombe County, where I began to work, which is largely a working class population, I'm not just talking about Princeton. I'm talking about the larger study that we did, which you, you read about. Pitt, Pitt County. The adjacent county, within which Greenville is the principal city, uh, there we found a, we were to find a, a pretty sizable middle class, black middle class population. To, be, to look more carefully at the social gradient of hypertension, so that's why we went to Pitt County, and we and that was where we we saw some really interesting things going on that were different between men and women, particularly middle class men, in contrast to middle class women. All, we're talking about all African Americans. 
So when you get to the middle class, the, I, I do think that the possibility of a divergence of life experiences and stressors across gender lines um, comes into play in a way that it might not come into play. It's going to come into play among working class folks as well, but I think it's going to look a little different the higher up the economic ladder you go. Uh, the, the stressors among African Americans you know, near the tippy top, if you will, of the uh, economic ladder become more subtle. They become very subtle at that point. And the reason why they, they can be problematic for, um, for African Americans who find themselves in settings uh, from which they were previously, historically, barred. Uh, the problem is there's no paradigm. 